Welcome to the Sales Career Podcast. This is your host, Kevin Hopp. Whether you're an executive, sales leader, or just getting your career in sales started, I'm here to help you read between the lines and hear the real stories that you can't get from a resume or from a LinkedIn profile, all designed to help you shape your own sales career. Let's dive right into today's episode and see what we can learn. All right, welcome back to another edition of the Sales Career Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Hopp. This week's guest is a current venture capitalist, a guy who in his sales career has worked for companies like Google, Salesforce, and Box. I followed him for many years on social media, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and I highly recommend you follow him as well. Everybody, please welcome the great and powerful Doug Landis. <laughs> great and powerful. Thank you. It's quite the intro. I don't know if I can live up to it. I don't know. I'm just... Uh... I, I like to I like to say I'm lucky, and in fact, it's tattooed on my arm. How about that? You can't even see that. But look at that. It's tattooed on my arm. That it's spelled with two e's. It's my Burning Man name, my Playa name. There you go. There's something. Your Playa name is lucky. There's, some, there's something that not a whole lot of people knew. I, yeah, I went to Burning Man in the early days and gone nine times. And yes, that is my Playa name, Lucky. <laughs> Doug Landis, the burner. I love that. Wow. Things you won't find Things on LinkedIn profile. Things you will profile. not find on LinkedIn, that's for sure. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, let, let's get into it here. So if, if someone takes a, a quick look at your LinkedIn profile, the biggest trend that I'm seeing there is training. Like you, you got into training really early in your career. Is, is that the case that you've always been a trainer? No, 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 no. And you know, the interesting thing is like, I, I don't even like the you know label of being a trainer. I mean, I think... I think we're all coaches in our own right. Um, I think training is very kind of one way. It, it, it comes across as very much a one way experience. I'm training you on something and then you go off and, and you do it. Um, yeah. I'm much more a fan of kind of the interactive experience, but no, I mean, look at the end of the day, man, I'm a, I'm a sales professional wrapped in a marketer's body. Um, Training is a, is a is a piece of who I am. Um, I would even I would even unpack that even more and, and pull that up a thousand feet and just give you a little context on how I got into that. Uh, you know, I I started selling when I was well, shit. I could I could I, you could argue that I've been in sales my entire life. You know, my first sales job was selling okay. selling newspapers. You know, to my neighbors on my newspaper route when I was up at you know four thirty in the morning literally in my garage, hand folding newspapers, putting them over my shoulders, getting on my bike and riding around and tossing newspapers and then trying to sell subscriptions to different, to different, uh, to different neighbors, um, in Palo Alto of all places. And so like, you know, the, the, I, cool. the notion of, you know, uh, understanding, I have something that I think is a value. I think that it might be of interest in, in to you. Let's have a conversation about that. Is something that has just been kind of innate in me and my whole family, my whole life. Um, I took a turn when I was when I was in college. Um, I graduated from the University of Oregon, and I was actually I was a political science major, and I was all ready to go to law school. And I was going to go, you know, try big cases. Wow. Um, my father was an attorney at the time, and he talked me out of it. So I was like, "Oh shit, what do I do now?" And um, Right. You know, because I had, I had a number of, you know, growing up, it's like, you know, I had a number of sales jobs. I worked in retail. I worked in restaurants, restaurants, you're always selling retail. You're always selling. Um, the one like non sales career that I, I would say I had that I actually loved. That's still a core part of who I am is I worked construction for a long time. I was like an apprentice carpenter. Um, and so that's actually part of the reason why, when I was at, when I was graduating from the University of Oregon, I'd spent an entire year in the career center. I spent so much time there just trying to understand, like, what do I do with these skills that I have and how do I parlay this into something? Because I knew I wasn't going to law school. Um, and so yep. um, I kept, you know, the one kind of profession that kept coming up and people wanted to talk to me about because of my communication skills because of my ability to influence others, my ability to motivate people. Everybody kept saying, you should get in sales, you should get in sales. So of course I did a, a ton of research and I, I had a, a number of interviews 
with companies that were, you know, that when they, I don't, I don't even know if they still do this, but companies that would come to the college campus and do these, you know, kind of interviews. Yep. It's everything from pharmaceutical sales to, you know, I mean, you name it, to selling, you know, working for sure. enterprise rent a car. Those are all like the companies that would come to oh, college campuses, dude. right, and sell these experiences. And they're still doing that. Uh, it's, they're it, still it's, doing that to this it's day. It's wild. <laughs> I tell you what, man, it was like. I, I worked my ass off to really try and carve out like what I thought I could bring to the table. And you know, the hardest part I think when you're graduating from college is like, what skills do I have? Cause it's not like you've necessarily had a ton of jobs. Now in today's environment, cause I grew up in Palo Alto. I mean, it's like kids are, are starting companies in high school. And so it's very different, right? When they're going to college and getting out right. of college, they're like, oh yeah, I've already had three startups, sold two of them to, you know, to Twitter. And you know, now I'm ready to go be an engineer or whatever. And you're like, dude, what the, <laughs> wait, what? How, what, what time do you get up? Like, how old are you? Um, but back when I was in school, you know, I think, you know, and, and even today, a lot of people are still questioning, like, what the hell am I going to do with my life? And what experiences do I have? What skills do I have? Fortunately, I was heavily involved in, in athletics at the university and then the interfraternity council. I was vice president of the IFC. I was president of my fraternity house. I, 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 got, I got involved. So I had some leadership um, experience, um, but I never yeah. really formal training of doing anything of, you know, kind of in the corporate world. Um, but right. remember I said, one of my jobs growing up was in construction. So I knew all about power tools, building, construction, the whole industry. And so um, I got an interview at Black & Decker and I was like, this is great. Because I think anytime you're gonna go I mean, it's, it's helpful no matter what you do, it's really helpful if you know about the industry that you're getting into um, and you've got a point of view. And in my case, I was super passionate about it. I mean, I, I love construction, I still do today. I love, yeah. I love building shit. Maybe that's why I'm, you know, I work with startups because I just love the building a aspect of it all. Um, and I interviewed and I got a, I got a job working for Black & Decker out in, the, out in the field selling, so they had just launched they just bought DeWalt Power Tools and they had launched, they had just launched their, their, their accessories line. So imagine it's like, you know, a hardware company like HP launching their software division. That was the same thing, right? Because accessories are like saw blades, drill yeah. bits, screwdriver bits, all of those things. Those things that they make a ton of margin on um, and they turn over a hell of a lot more, a lot faster than the power tools because they're expensive and they're, they're a lot more overhead for a company. So sure. um, they gave me... It was rad. I mean, right out of college, they moved me to Colorado. They gave me a, a company credit card and a car, company car. And I literally drove from Canada to Mexico. I covered the Rockies. And I would just go door to door selling power tools and accessories to different hardware stores. It was wild. So wild. Love that. Door to door, to door sales Dude. is a great way, great, great place to start. You know, it's something, I, I tell you, there are two things that I, I recommend to everybody doing at some point in time in their life, if, they're, if they ever want to be in sales. Go do a door to door sales job, although today it's way more risky because I don't know if people feel as safe of answering the door, right? So I'm not going to ding dong, I'm selling right. Cutco knives. I mean, I tell you down here in LA, you might, you know, you might get a, you might get a taser to the face. Um, yeah, because everyone is a little bit skittish because there's, you know, crime, unfortunately, is quite rampant in a lot of areas. But, you know, selling door to door. And then the other thing is, like, go work at a place like Oracle to where you could cut your teeth. Because I, I after I left the world of Black & Decker, I actually went to go work at Oracle, which is a, a, another part of the story. But I'll tell you, the thing that I learned the most at Black & Decker, um, it's kind of twofold, really. I love, again, I love... I love hardware stores and, and it's largely due to the fact that my grandfather built a hardware store from the ground up from scratch in Nashville, New Hampshire. So as a kid, cool. I grew up running around hardware stores. I love hardware stores. I mean, you get me in a Home Depot and I'm like, ha, 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 ha. I'm like Tim, the tool man, Taylor. Right. <laughs> um, cool. And, uh, but what I learned, so the two things that I learned when I was at, when I was at Black and Decker, um, one was I, I got, a little burnt out on the industry itself. I, I, I needed a little bit more of the, um, the, the, I, I just needed a more dynamicism, if that's even a word. I needed a more dynamic environment. The hardware, you know, kind of a B to B to C retail environment just wasn't super exciting after a period of time. But the thing that I will tell you that I learned that I will never forget, and it's, in fact, it's a core thesis of how I help 
our portfolio companies today and how I help sellers today think about how to have a business conversation with a constituent, a buyer, a, a stakeholder, is predicated on what I learned going selling door to door at Black & Decker. Want to know what it is? Right. What is it? <laughs> so um, you may have read my rants about this, but I'm not a big fan of discovery as a stage. Like I just don't like discovery annoys the shit out of me. Right. Um, and it's largely because look, when I was going door to door, I wasn't, I didn't have time to do discovery. I'm walking into a brand new, I'm not a brand new, I'm walking into a mom and pop hardware store and I'm assessing their business and I'm having a business conversation with them looking for ways in which I can help drive more top line revenue or I can, you know, help them turn more inventory. I can help them, you know, reduce some of their overhead and cost based on the products that they already had in house and help them rethink their product strategy. So it's a business conversation. There wasn't discovery and then a pitch and then a demo. And then, you know what I mean? Like I, that shit just doesn't happen when yeah. you're selling door to door. And, and unfortunately now in the world of software, we've got these stages, right? Like I'm in stage one qualification. I'm in stage two discovery. I'm in stage three, demo. I'm in stage four, negotiating, right? And what, what I found yeah. was, like, what I had to learn rather quickly was how to assess a business and understand what's going on in that business so I could have a real meaningful conversation with them. So I would pull into a hardware store parking lot and I would just park. I would just sit there for a minute. And I would look at the cars that were coming and going. Do they have a lot of contractors middle of the, you know, in the morning or middle of the day? Was it just regular mom and pop neighbors popping in and hanging out? Like how full was the parking lot? Um, what products do they promote? You know, in terms of advertising all around, you know, all around the outside. Do they have a lumber? Yeah, that, they have a lumber yard, a right? So I'm just sitting there looking and observing, and then I would walk into the store, and I'm looking for how many people are in the store, how stocked are the shelves. How clean are the shelves? What's the experience like if I were going to come in and actually try and buy something? Well, if I walk up to you know a particular, uh, you know, if I, you know, how long before someone comes up and says, you know, can I help you? Um, you know, and then I'm looking at specifically, then I go into like the power tools section. I'm looking at power tools and accessories and what they sell, and I'm looking at price points and the margins, right? So I'm assessing the business so that when I do finally ask to meet with the owner or the GM or whoever is in charge. I've got a point of view about what's going on in their world. Yeah. And that is what I recommend to every seller going into a conversation with a prospect or even an existing customer. Have a point of view about what's going on in their world, in their industry, in their company, and in their role or function. So if I'm talking to an owner, my conversation is different about the point of view about what's going on because maybe I, I also realize that there's a Lowe's hardware being built five miles down the street and I'm talking to the owner and I'm like, what are you going to do? How are you going to compete? And by the way, my grandfather's hardware store that was built by hand, brick by brick, went out of business because of a Lowe's hardware store. So I can really empathize with that owner. Right. Um, or if I was talking to a general manager or even just a store manager, it was like, okay, so my hunch is you care about product turnover, you care about margin, you're also worried about theft, given the location of where you are. I know, you know, we're in the middle of, we're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, just the products just walk out the shelf, off the shelf. So it's, it's, you know, the more I knew and understood about my domain, power tools, construction, accessories, the works, it made it easier for me to go into a company or a business and assess what's going on and develop a point of view. And so I, I recommend this to every seller so, out there is develop that point of view. By the way, the point of view didn't even have to be right. I could be way off. Like, yeah, Lowe's is coming in down there. It's no, actually but, great, right? It's good for us because all the locals are going to come to us. They're going to they're gonna shy away from, from a big box like that. But the point of view allows you to start somewhere, right? To start right. somewhere as opposed to like – what what what's worse than taking a meeting and the the seller says so tell me about your business oh my gosh. Tell me about what you're doing it's like i honestly i like I, you, I would, like you don't know I'd kick him out be like fuck out of here sorry you're you're done get out of here i don't have time for this and the problem is right now yeah. sellers put too much responsibility on the buyer to tell them what they need and that's not how it works right 
There's a reason why product-led growth is, is in existence today, because individual buyers like myself got tired of dealing with SDRs and dumbass AEs that get on the call and they're like, cool, so tell me about your business. What are you worried about? What keeps you up at night? What you know? What, are you, what problems are you trying to solve? Like, do 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 you fucking moron. What, like, what pain are you into oh there? Oh my gosh, it's so dumb. So if you come to the conversation with a point of view, right. now we're talking. Because at least you demonstrate that you've you've got some level of empathy because you've given some thought. You're building some level of connection, uh-huh. and you you have a little bit more credibility than someone that just launches into a whole list of questions that they're supposed to ask. So that's what I learned when I was at Black Absolutely. and Decker. This is Scott. I mean, this was, geez, this is like 30, 30 years ago or something. I'm dating myself. It's wild. I, I won't tell you how old I am, but you might have been doing that since before I was before I was born. That's frightening, but funny. <laughs> no, but but I but I love it because this is uh this is an incredible opportunity to learn that like look thirty years later, it doesn't sales hasn't really changed that much. Like all the cool tools, all the cool technology, all that. Um, still like the thing that you're still talking about here as one of uh, a voice on LinkedIn, a voice investing in companies, a voice who's been at the biggest name brands, Google, Salesforce, Oracle, like you're still talking about stuff that was so basic to your core that you learned it when you were a teenager selling power tools. Yeah. Well, I wasn't like, I wasn't a teenager, but yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know, it's, you know, it's, this is why I have such a, I have such a, like a bromance with Todd Capone because Todd is like, he's a historian and a sales leader, and and he combines his understanding of history and what was happening historically. You know, like we're like two peas in a pod because we get like what was old, what is consider- considerably old, right? About some of the practices that were happening yeah. in terms of how we engaged with customers and prospects, how we handled objections, how we, you know, how we navigated the negotiations. All those things are still relevant today, hundreds of years later. Yeah. It, and, you know, I don't know, this comes back to like something that I am kind of obsessed with in my career where I, I would when, when I would work at startups and work at small companies, I would have the feeling that I was reinventing the wheel. Like I would think to myself, like, are we the first company to try to do outbound? Are we the first? Co- and I've told this little story before on this podcast where. When I was an SDR, the first time I was an SDR, the, the guy who was not our direct leader, but he was a guy who like helped train us, he was in the enterprise side, at the first all-hands meeting when we had 12 SDRs in the room, he said, guys, this experiment is working great. And we were like, experiment? Like, this is my, this is my job. Like, <laughs> what do you mean experiment? Are we the first people to ever do sales development? The year was 2015. Yeah. I can tell you. I can tell you the answer to that is no, because sales development, just, right. just so you know, it actually did not start at Salesforce. Aaron Ross did not start sales development, just so you know. Sorry, Aaron. I grew up with him. We grew up in right. Palo Alto together. He didn't start outbound. He didn't start predictable revenue. Uh uh-uh. uh You know where it was started? Way back in the day at Oracle. We were at SDRs Oracle. at Oracle. The machine existed way back then we were we had to get up at 5 30 in the morning put a suit on and drive from san francisco down to redwood shores which was like you know 30 minutes without traffic depending upon where you lived in the city and we would pound the phones and if you weren't making 100 calls a day we had a printout list now they've got all these gamification applications you can see how you're performing a printout list at the end of every week and if you're on the bottom 10 percent at the end of the month you're at risk of getting fired we would take naps under our desk and everybody – I sat next to Bob Fratty from Slack. Like I sat next to Erica Rulofson. Oh, shoot. She goes, Erica – what's her – oh, man. I just know her as Erica Rulofson. I know she's married and has a different last name. But she's the president of, of, of uh, Confluent. I, I sat, we sat next to her. Wow. Uh, we, it's, we're pounding the phones, yeah. closing deals, right? Some of my closest friends on the planet today are from the SDR world when we were at Oracle. By the way, Larry – Ellison, guess who worked for Larry Ellison at Oracle? Mark Benioff. Yep. Right? He was the poster child. He was Larry's, like, Larry's, Larry's protege. And uh, so where did Mark learn 
this old model, early days of Oracle, brought it over to Salesforce because it made sense. I mean, we had SDRs yeah. and then this thing called NT sales because we were selling, you know, to a specific kind of server uh, uh, environment. And then there was like major accounts and then, you know, national accounts and all that. It's wild. Super wild. It is wild. Well, um, talk to me a little bit about, so like your resume has some insane <laughs> companies. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not every day that I talk to somebody who's like, you're like an OG Silicon Valley. <laughs> like you grew up at Oracle and then you worked at Google and Salesforce. And then I believe you were there for an exit with Box, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, you know, I mean, I got I got, I got, I'm going to, I'm going to credit luck for a lot of my, the companies that I've, I've ended up uh, at because I grew up in an area where just phenomenal companies were developing and, and evolving. Yeah. I mean, if I grew up in, this is no offense, but if I grew up in like, you know, Scottsdale, Arizona, which I love Scottsdale, love Arizona. Um, yeah. It's different. It's different. I'd, I'd have. I'd likely be, you know, a semi pro pro golfer. <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like it's part Wouldn't of that be nice. part, yeah, yeah, trust me. A part of it's your environment, right? So I got I grew up in an environment. Oh, yeah. And part of the reason why so when I when I left Black and Decker, I was at Black and Decker for four years. They moved me to Colorado from from Oregon, they moved me to Colorado to San Francisco to Chicago. And then when I was at Chicago, I knew absolutely no nobody when I moved there. And when I was after like a year and a half in Chicago, they're like, We want to move you to headquarters out to Towson, Maryland. And I was like, oof. Uh, I don't know if the hardware industry is for me anymore. Um, hardware slash retail. Yeah. And I don't know if I want to move to Maryland. Uh, I kind of miss being back in the Bay Area. So let's 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 go do something that's a little bit more interesting in my wheelhouse. I had some friends that worked at Oracle. Mm -hmm. They got me an interview. I, so by the way, I was out in the field selling. So I was selling deals to Lowe's. I was selling big deals to huge hardware retail chains at Black & Decker. I got a job at Oracle. After four years in the field, they made me be, I had to be a, become an SDR. I was an SDR. Yeah. I had four years of field sales That's... experience with like carrying like a $5 million right. quota and I had to be an SDR. Cause they're like, you don't have any industry experience. That, yeah. Yep. That's uh that's like the, one of the most common things that is like a gripe of folks, right? Like if you, if you come from any other industry besides SaaS, you got to start at the bottom. Make you start. No, but here's start at the bottom. I'll, I'll tell you though, two things. Well, there's three things that that I, I take away from that. One, as I mentioned before, some of my closest friends on the planet, um, even as of today, from that experience way back when. Um, number two, it I you know being at a company like Oracle where they unfortunately largely you know they managed with stick with fear. It was very very fear driven. Yeah. You're always afraid you're going to get fired. Um, you know what? We learned discipline. Oh my gosh, we learned discipline. It was like military. It's like you're here on time. You you know you do you hit your numbers. You do the job. You take the training. You don't. There's no. There's no fucking about. There's no training is not mandated. No. No. Uh. You do what we say you're gonna do. And oh, by yeah. the way, if you follow the playbook, you're going to be successful. Um. Yeah. There is not that same level of discipline in the world that we live in today. And it's for some of us OG folks, man, it's frustrating. Oh my gosh. It's super frustrating. It's like, oh, yeah. do the fucking job, clean up your pipeline, own your territory, be the CEO of your territory. Don't expect leads from anybody else. This is your job, be the CEO of your territory, right? And so I'll tell you, as much as I hated being an SDR, I appreciated it because it taught me skills that I actually hadn't really fu f fully developed at all because I was just thrown out in the field. And so, you know, and I had a huge brand name like Black & Decker behind me, so it was really easy to, you know, you know, walk in and get appointments or to call and get an appointment. But, um, so it, it taught me a lot about the, the, the how to prospect, how to engage, how to overcome objections, how to, how to, you know, infuse a conversation with some FUD without being, you know, an asshole about your competition because we competed against, you know, Microsoft and SAP and many others. And then, you know, the interesting thing was because I had so much field sales experience, I was fortunate enough and I did well enough as an SDR that they allowed me to skip two levels. 
and I went straight from an SDR uh, up to you know major account sales or national account sales or something like that. And so um, I was rewarded for the fact that I already had all this experience. Now, part of the reason why yeah. I left Oracle at the time was actually twofold. Um, and again, this is why it's you know I, I share this with 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 you because you know there's a theme, right? When I was at Black and Decker, I realized I'd kind of reached my my I, I I felt like I was done with the industry, with you know, with that company, with my progression. I was like, I'm good. At Oracle, I didn't necessarily feel like I was done, but I ran into a bunch of politics because it was a big company, and um, and I don't I don't I don't play politics. Yeah. I'm a straight shooter. Like, you want to make me you know yeah. jump through all these hoops? And the reality at the time is I had an offer to go you know to go work out in the field because I'd already been out in the field and, you know, my boss was like, no, no, you haven't put enough time in as, you know, as, a, as an AE, commercial AE under, under my regime. And I was like, well, that's dumb. Like, why, like, why are you gonna do that? And then what I realized, ultimately what I realized is like, I wanted to go to somewhere small again and build. Um, mind you from there, <laughs> you know, uh, where did I go? Well, I went and started my own company. Big. No, I didn't go big. So what's not in my LinkedIn is you, oh, talk, you talked about, you know, you talked about like what's on your LinkedIn. I mean, what you're getting on my LinkedIn is like the last 15 years, but like there's stuff in between that you just don't add because it's not really additive to the conversation. But I mean, I probably could add this, but I went and started my own company. My a friend and I, a friend of mine and I on the back of a napkin um, had an idea, went out and raised capital and started a company. It was awesome. It was amazing. Whoa. What was it? What'd you do? Um, the company was called, <laughs> my, my buddy will laugh about this, but the company was called Grant Connect. And we were basically like Match.com, but for nonprofits. So basically, so think of it this way. We're like, there are thousands, there are over 5,000. In fact, today, there's probably over 8,000 nonprofit organizations in the US. And most of them get their funding from a select group of either institutions or, or you know, uh, um, donors, right, that are in the neighborhood, yep. in the area. Sure. What they don't realize is there are funding institutions, government agencies, trusts, uh, foundations that you can get money from that are looking for you as a nonprofit, but you don't have the resources to go out and find them because they all fund at different cycles. Right. They have a different process for getting access to their funding, et cetera. They make it kind of hard to get yeah. access to money. And so, you know, a lot of these small nonprofits just don't have the resources. So we built a a system that actually matched nonprofits to funding solutions, and then we filled in the application for them. And so it got them to the point to where, you know, a funder could decide whether or not they wanted to actually have a meeting with them. So we eliminated a lot wow. of the, the heavy lifting for these nonprofits. Um, it was great. Interesting. It was amazing. It was, it was amazing. And it was something that I thought I was going to do for the rest of my life. And then, you know, the first wave of the dot crash I think that was in the 2000s, early 2000s hit. And, um, and you know, we had, we had raised, you know, it was crazy. We'd raised three rounds of capital and um, I think we had like 25 employees and, and we were, our product was just about to come out. Our new product was just about to come out. And there was two problems that we ran into. Number one, we were charging because we didn't want to charge the nonprofits. We wanted to charge the funders, you know, the institutions, because we were giving them access to all these new, you know, potential recipients for their funding. Well, we learned sure. a, we learned a couple of things. Number one, foundations and trusts and government agencies, dude, that is an old boys network, and they want the nonprofits to come crawling to them, to work hard, to put in the you know the the eighty two hours to fill out their application. They want that. It's like. You need to, you got to earn it to come to me. So we were like, we were streamlining a process that they, that the funders didn't really want streamlined. They wanted to find all the nonprofits. They yeah. just didn't want the process streamlined. And number two, um, you know, they also didn't really want to pay for it either. They're like, wait, why are we going to pay for it? We're already paying, you know, we're already paying them a bunch of money. And then, and then, you know, the dot com crash happened because people were, you know, raising a hundred million dollars on the back of a napkin, napkin for shoestrings.com. Um, yeah. or pets.com. That was a good story for y'all. Um, and you know, we were never going to show like, you know, 10, 20 X on our, on our, on our investments because we were serving an industry that is not, they're not paying that much. We didn't want to overcharge everybody. So we had to, uh, you know, we had to shut it down. It sucked. 
brutal. Wow. Jeez, and you would never even know Doug Land is the business owner. <laughs> I've followed you for years. I've probably followed you for five years on LinkedIn. Yeah. And I did not know that story. <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. I mean, it was a, it was like, and I, I've never, I've experienced this as a child of divorce, but I've never experienced divorce myself. Knock on wood, I don't. Um, but it was like, it was like getting a divorce. I mean, like I, we had to let everybody go. I was broke because I put all my money, you know, I didn't get paid for, you know, three years. Um, you know, and the market was, was super volatile because it was, you know, we were, it was, it was due for a correction, much like today's market is happening right now. And, um, I was like, well, shit, what am I going to do with my life now? <laughs> it was wild. Right. It was super wild. And what was the answer? What, what did you end up doing? Well, you, you went back into sales or is I, that when you got into training? So I, well, no, not yet. I, um, so I got to clear my glasses. I need to be able to see. So, uh, I took a little break. Um, I did a bunch of reality TV shows cause they were just starting to take off. I had, you know, I auditioned. Like auditioned. you were a participant. Yes. Yes. I've been on four reality TV shows. I'm also, we have to You've been on four? Yeah, 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 yeah totally. I'm a, I'm a professionally trained actor. I went to acting school. I went to Gene Shelton's Actors Lab in San Francisco. Um, I thought about going that direction. I thought about going the direction of like acting and film, but I didn't really want to leave the Bay Area and everything was really happening down in LA. And I didn't really want to be like everybody else, like a waiter and, and an actor, you know? Um, and, growing, yeah. and growing up in the Bay Area, I was kind of like, kind of dig, kind of dig it here. Kind of like all this technology. Maybe I can figure something out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I did, you know, I just kind of, I kind of bounced around for a little while. And then I landed at, oh, no, I took a job at, um, oh, this is great. So this is wild. A friend of mine reached out to me and um, he asked me to come work with him. This is kind of where the training fits in to uh, come work with him at a company called Monster Cable audio video cable, right? Because I had the black and Decker retail distribution experience. They're like, Hey, come work with us and help us figure out how we continue to drive more revenue. Um, you know, it's a, it's a founder owned company. He's a billionaire. He's a genius. He's a total mad scientist. He's a total, he's completely and totally insane. Um, but I'll tell you <laughs> the thing that I learned about working there was, and this is actually relevant in today's world. I, it was more like, you know, yes, we were doing training, but at the end of the day, what we were focused on was distribution. Distribution is king in today's world. So even in the software world, what are your distribution channels and what channels do you own? And when you own a distribution channel, you can shove a whole bunch of stuff down that pipe. And, 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 if, and based on your brand and brand awareness and the value proposition of your brand and what you deliver, people will consume it. Right. So right. I learned an incredible lesson on distribution because monster cable, while it was high end audio video cable, they own the distribution channels for audio video cable and everything associated with it. Basically all the accessories for audio video, um, for, for, for all retail. So if they wanted to roll out a new product like beats, by the way, beats by Dr. Dre, that was created by Noel uh -huh. Lee's son, Kevin Lee. And Dr. Dre and Jimmy IV basically stole it from him. Wild, crazy story. You can look it up on the internet. You can look up Kevin Lee and, and Jimmy IV and, and Dr. Dre and Beats headphones. It's such a crazy story because Kevin, Kevin Lee, he grew up on a knoll. There are audio files. They've got incredible ears. And Kevin's like, I want to do something on my own. I want to go start headphones. And Noel's like, no, no, no. We got too much other stuff to do. And Kevin went off and did it on his own without Noel's knowing about it. And so... He got himself into some some legal pickles because he was up against Dr. Dre and, and Jimmy Iv. It was wild, super wild. But and then Dr. Dre sold it for a billion. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. Totally. Kevin basically made his money back, and uh, yeah, Dr. Dre, you know, and and Jimmy Iv sold it for over a billion. It's pretty wild. Wild. Crazy. So I was there for a period of time, and it was and it was driving. So we were selling into the circuit cities and the Best Buys, the world. But we were focused on how do we, so selling in doesn't matter unless you can sell through, right? So I can't go sell more products to Best Buy 
if they already have a ton of products already on the shelves and in a warehouse. So in order to go sell more products, you've got to help them figure out how they're going to sell what they already have. Right. So you think about it, it's largely like you can't go expand or upsell your customers until you help them get to, to get the most value out of what they already have. Right. So way, way, way back yeah. then, I learned, learned about distribution and distribution channels. And distribution is king and sell through. Those two things in today's environment still matter, which is wild. 100%. <laughs> that and is wild. then well, from there, I went to Google, and that's when I got into the sales training and, and what I would call sales more sales productivity, not even just sales training, because training is, is usually just like, you know, content delivery, if you will, or content creation and delivery. I'm much more about like, okay, right. let's figure out how to make you hit your quota and beyond, which is more than that. Love that. Right. Well, Whew. you know, that was a lot. Doug, I, I there's there's the, and there and we just hit we just hit the all the stuff that you can see on your LinkedIn and I really want to hear about what it was like at Box and then what it was like when you decided to get into the VC world and what what your job entails now cuz as you and I have talked about before, I think you probably have like my dream job probably like well, talk, talking to to many different companies and and helping them figure out sales models, right? I mean, but but like I guess what I'm I bring all this up because we don't have time. <laughs> this no one will listen to the end of the podcast. I've done a lot of research on this. If we go longer than about 40 40ish minutes, oh, yeah. listenership yeah. will drop off like a cliff. Totally. 100%. That doesn't I'm not surprise. I'm not Joe Rogan yet. When, <laughs> when 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 I am Joe Rogan, I'll I'll do my 3 hour long diatribe podcast. Cuz I listen to every minute of a Joe Rogan podcast. I'm one of those sickos who like <laughs> I'll listen to it 6 different times to get through all 3 hours of it. <laughs> but awesome. not everybody's like that. So so Doug, I I, uh, I end every episode by asking the same three questions, a little consistency for Ask. for folks to learn about. Awesome, awesome. So the first question is, what in, in your your long sales career, what what has been the biggest commission check you've ever gotten? Whoa, the biggest commission check I've ever gotten was one point two million dollars. Um, a commission check? Yeah. Sorry, I just had to turn my air. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> you just ten x the best answer I had before that. <laughs> well, you know, here's you know. I, Hey, look, salespeople are we're, we're great at gaming the system. Um, you know, right. you got to figure out ways in which you can maximize your comp plan, and that is so critical to to do to do that is to figure out how can you maximize your comp plan. Back in the day at Oracle, by the way, one of the things we got comped on, we didn't get quota quota credit or relief. We had a cap; we could only do deals of about 100k, right? But okay, how do you do a 10 million dollar deal where you get paid? You know, where you can make. 800,000 or a million dollars in commission, depending upon how you're performing. The one thing we could do is sell services, education, training, uh, uh, support, you know, premium gold, platinum support, right? You could do that mm -hmm. and make a bunch mm -hmm. of money. And so our field sales counterparts would, we would have, we may, we'd uncover a deal. We would take down a hundred K of it. They'd take down, you know, 20 million and then they would give us the education piece. So we could take that down. So it's kind of cheating, but it's knowing how to maximize but your comp plan. It, uh, yeah, but we we have a we have a new champion here at the Sales Career Podcast. One point two million. I uh, yeah, that's that's a lot in a commission check. Love it. So the next question I ask everybody is, uh, of all the jobs you've had in your life, what has been your favorite job? <sighs> I, that's that's an unfair question, and it's only because of the fact that every job in the moment is my favorite job. But every job goes through a life cycle. It's your favorite job, and then you know, and then you feel like you've you've mastered it, and then you kind of start on the downward trend. Where like you know what, maybe I'm a little bored. Maybe I need to be challenged more maybe i'm i need to i want to move and i want to you know different kind of work life experience whatever it may be so there's like there's not there's not a a i wouldn't say i have a a an answer because i've loved my time at literally every one of the companies that i've been at literally 
There's only, oh, there's a, only been like two, two companies that I was like, what the hell? Get out of here. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's, that's really good. Uh, not everybody has that kind of, that, that kind of view of it, I guess. But that is, that is so true that the, the honeymoon stage of, of getting a job for some jobs can last three months. Sometimes it's six months. Sometimes it's three years. And it's like, you really, really like it. And then all of a sudden something changes, you know, well, but like, it, like my father, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. What, what was that? No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say like my, my father is, is coming to year, the end of year 35 at the same job. Nice. He's about to retire. And, and in the last year, in the last year of 35 year stint, management has made these giant shifts towards, you know, recruiting millennials and like trying to work on Gen Z now. And he is like, rah, 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 rah. like he can't stop complaining about it. He's like, so on the way out. So it's, it's just funny that he made it 34 years before he really didn't like his job. There you go. <laughs> you know? There you go. Yeah. Um, do you have a, do you have a point to make about that? Or? No, I was going to say, I mean, like, look, I think, I think one of the things that you have to be careful about, and this is too evident today is three months is way too short to feel like everything's changed that dramatically. You've just gotten in the yeah. job. You've just gotten fully ramped. You've just gotten an understanding of like where the real opportunity is and you know, how difficult or how hard this is. Like three months, a year isn't honestly a, enough time. Like you need to put two solid years in there to really truly understand what you can take away from the learn from the experience that you're getting at that company. If you're gonna if it's if you're leaving at three advice. months, if you're leaving at three months, you might as well leave at three weeks. It's better. And, yeah. then, and then you don't yeah. even have well, to, don't even well, have to probably, put on your resume. <laughs> yeah, well, it probably means that you had something wrong from the day from the day you started. Yeah, right. It means that there's something fundamentally. I, I think there are a lot um, of I think there are a lot of cool. people out there that have bad pickers. They're just not great at picking great companies. That's right. I believe that. Um, okay, last. All right, last, last question. question. And this this question might. You might be one of the guys, uh, one of the first guys on this podcast where it's actually true. Where So the last question is, imagine money didn't matter anymore and you don't have to work. What would you do with your time? Golf, surf, read, write. Golf and surf. I mean, uh, and, and I still do have to work. I've got expensive tastes. Um, I, and I also, right, I, also right. I also have a number in my head that once once I get there then I, I can retire I'm not I'm not there yet but um, yeah I mean I, you know I look I've I, of course travel's always going to be a thing of 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 pleasure um, but I travel so much and I've traveled so much my whole life you know I think I'm about to hit two million miles on a United plane and um oh, that's a lot and and you know so like travel yes but but the the freedom to decide when i want to travel and leave on a wednesday and come back on a friday versus having to go on a friday and come back on a monday that to me is more important than the travel itself it's the freedom of when i can go just like the freedom of when i can go surf or when i can go play golf it's to me what what matters the most in retirement is freedom freedom yeah that's uh, that's like the that's the dream. I want people thinking of it. Like it, some of the answers that I get from people when I ask that are really interesting. Like, you know, hardcore sales leader guy. I'll say like, I'd write creative novels every day. I'm like, <laughs> really? Yeah, totally. That's so interesting to totally. me. And other people say like, oh, I do yoga all day every day. I'm like, oh, yoga, all right. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I might even think about know, how much time. I might I might get involved in you know sports teams and sports leagues like the you know get involved with the la rams or get involved in the you know at in uh in pga golf tournaments and go volunteer there or become an announcer i don't know i mean like i don't i don't i don't know honestly i don't it's a hard question it's it's a question that you like you get gets you thinking but at the end of the day you have no idea what that answer is until you're actually in that position because it That's also right. depends, it also That's depends right. on Unless, like your partner you know. like like if I'm ready to retire and my wife's not, and she wants to keep working in her schedule, then well, I guess what? I'm likely not really going to retire. I'm going to, you know, consult or advise, or you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to kind of align my schedule yeah. with hers so that we can, you know, we can spend some more quality time together. So that's right. That's right. Spend. And I guess I asked the question because it's more. 
it's more it's more philosophical on what if you won the lottery tomorrow or what yeah. if the company you're working at where you have great equity sold for 50 billion and all of a sudden you got 300 million in your lap you're like great yo i don't need to work that you know? by the way like, th- but, then what do you do by the by the way there's there's i don't need to work and then there's i've got fuck you money and 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 here's fuck you money, and, right. and here's the difference right? if i got 300 million in my bank account i am not not working anymore because we would buy a building for women who are in abused and battered, battered relationships who have families who need to get back on their feet. And we would create a situation where they could rent. We would give them rent free apartment for six months, six to 12 months. And we would open up like a shop or a restaurant and they could have a job there so they could build up their credit so they can actually go out and apply for an apartment and start living their life on their own. That's one of the things that we would do. Wow. I mean that's that's a that's a well thought out plan. <laughs> oh yeah, we've thought about I like it that. a lot, um, but we just need more money than you know me being able to retire. <laughs> I need that three hundred million in the bank. Right. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Well, well, Doug, thank you so much. We we got to you know probably a, a good solid first half of your career story. I'm gonna <laughs> have to ask you to come back. Uh, I'm, well, I mean, you want the other I'm gonna half, slide just, into your Instagram. Just, just you want the other half? Just look on just look on LinkedIn. That 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 covers the most of it. It's there. It's a lot of it. Well, there. I, I'm sure I'm sure there's more to it. But hey, man, this is your chance to to pitch anything you want. How do people connect with you? How should they connect with you? Uh, I mean, Kevin, you should know me better than that. I don't, I don't believe in pitching. Even if you have a window to pitch, there's nothing to pitch. Um, if you want to get in, in, in contact with me and have a conversation, just find me on LinkedIn. It's not that hard. Um, I think I am the only Doug Landis. Uh, although I don't know if I've searched on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter too. Although I don't tweet that much at Doug Landis on Twitter. Find me on Instagram, whatever. Like find me, say hi. I'm not that Love hard. It. Awesome. Doug, thank, th- thanks for your time, man. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Kev. If this episode is interesting to you, please share your thoughts on LinkedIn or Twitter. Tag me, and I might just feature your post in an upcoming episode of the Sales Career Podcast. Or if you want to connect directly, go to hopconsultinggroup.com, and we'll find a way to work together. Cheers. Cheers.